Hello and welcome to the MBOM podcast, where you'll learn to master the business of yoga. MBOM is a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith. I'm a 500 hour registered yoga teacher, a yoga business coach, and a total business geek. Here at MBOM, you'll learn everything you need to know to create a sustainable yoga business by learning from myself and guests from around the world about how they built their yoga businesses and about how you too can become a successful yoga teacher, studio owner, and much more. All right, let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the MBM Podcast. I am super excited and grateful, as always, that you are joining me for today's episode of the show. And I know there are so many podcasts out there to choose from, so I just wanted to say thank you for tuning into this podcast and this episode. I'm super happy to have you here. And this week on the podcast, I am really excited to be joined by Erin Bridgman. Erin is a strategic money mastery coach who helps women step into financial classes clarity and change the world. Aaron teaches people how to own their value in a strategic way, capitalize on their time and streamline their businesses to work smarter, not harder. So in this episode, Aaron shares the importance of money mindset, how to shift your mindset around money to allow, allow abundance into your life, managing money and tips for getting clear on how much is coming in and out, the importance of this, how to make more money without working more hours and much more. I always find that talking about money is hugely impactful for me. And the more I do it, the less uncomfortable it becomes. So I hope that you have some takeaways, some aha moments, and maybe get some golden nuggets of wisdom out of this episode the same way that I did. This is just a really great conversation and a super, super powerful episode. Before we dive in, I just want to give a little shout out to the sponsor for this episode of the show, Offering Tree. Super grateful to have Offering Tree sponsoring and supporting the podcast. So I will tell you more about them and what they're up to a little bit later. But if you were looking for a one-stop shop for your yoga business, something for your website, your scheduling, your payments. If you're a yoga studio looking for a great software that can support you, Offering Tree's got your back. You can head on over to offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM to check them out. All right, more on that later, but for now, let's dive into the episode. Without further ado, here is Erin. Welcome to the show today, Erin. I'm really excited to have you here with me today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And can you share where you're joining me from today? I am in the beautiful Midwest, Indianapolis, Indiana. Oh, amazing. I've traveled so much of the U.S. on lots of road trips, but I've actually never been to Indiana. What? So, okay. I know, I know. I need to get there. I know. Most people think that it's just a bunch of cornfields, but the city of Indianapolis is pretty cool. Okay. Well, it's it's on my list. I'd like to go to every state in the U.S. at some point, so on my list. I'll have to stop by at some point. I, um, I was very close to, you know, I maybe even like drove, no, I didn't drive through the corner. I was going to say I was very close to it. Cause I drove through like St. Louis through to Nashville, like Kansas city, that route. So it was very, very close to there, but I never actually got there. Man, you're coming someday. Yeah. Someday I'll let you know. Um, so I'm super excited to dive into everything we're going to talk about today, but maybe we can talk just a little bit about, you know, who you are, what you do, share a little bit about that and how you got into what you're doing now. Yeah. So my journey, I've been in entrepreneurship for just over 10 years and I started as a wedding photographer so my husband and I were married. We had a ton of debt. We had low paying jobs and I always wanted to do, take pictures. So we um, bought a camera with our graduation money and I love people. I obviously had just gotten married so I, and I loved weddings. So I was like, okay, let's make this a business. Let's do this. And so we were able to scale that while working our other jobs into a six figure brand. And I was working in higher ed as well at the time, but just really felt in my heart, this desire to continue my work with mentoring women in more of a coaching capacity and saw like, Hey, I have all these pieces with, um, with having had a small business that was successful. So I moved into coaching. That was about five years ago. 
And we were also doing real estate stuff at the time. And as I continued to help people grow their brands and do what I had done, I kind of saw this common theme and it was around incredibly successful, talented women struggling with their money management, understanding their numbers, paying themselves consistently, and these money blocks that were kind of weaving into um, the challenge of the money management and money mindset. And uh, just, you know, I, I, I would be on calls with people and I'd just be like whipping out spreadsheets on the call like okay we can figure out this number let's let's um, reverse engineer this let's let's see your profitability how much can you pay yourself and so through the years as um, I continued to work with creative entrepreneurs this continued to be a theme and something that as uh, I guess a creative nerd I kind of wanted to bridge the gap here and really empower women with money and so that's where I find myself now is really focusing on being a strategic money coach for um, females. And um, also I run the real estate empire with my husband. So that's what I'm up to now. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all of that. And I'm curious for you, like what was kind of your I guess background with money, your money story, like your beliefs around money kind of before you got into this, like, did you have you know, a background with this or a story to overcome or yeah, share a little bit about that with me. Yeah. Oh, I love that you asked that question. I grew up in, you know, a home that my dad was the sole provider financially. And my dad and I are very, very close. And he always instilled in me the belief that I could do whatever I wanted to do and I could, whatever I put my heart and mind to. And so I had this like incredible work ethic and this ability of like, if I want something like I, like money's attainable and, but you know, so there's a gift in that, but also that you might have to work really, really hard to get it, but you can get it. And I, that translated into me even like selling books door to door in order to pay for college and things like that. And as far as like actual, like, do I, do I, am I a CPA or like what, like that has not been, I've, I am not certified in anything or that I think it's just my own journey, my own story of like, I, um, you know, had the creative business and figured out how to use my money and manage it so that I could then buy an investment property in real estate. And that afforded me the ability to pay off our student debt. We had almost $100,000 in student debt. And then that also afforded me the ability to quit my full-time job and do the photography thing because I knew I could pay myself my salary because I knew the numbers. And, um, So it was, I guess, my own journey and my own systems that I created for myself and for my clients as I was working with them. And just over the years, just being able to do work with dozens and dozens of women has helped me refine, uh, see patterns, create the money matrix system, be able to kind of support people in space that can be a very sensitive place. And um, yeah, just have a relatable story and I mean going back my in my childhood you know my generation before my parents they were you know they didn't have incredible access to money and so I know that I I saw in from my parents and them growing up in homes that you know definitely like they had they were living and doing well, but I mean, it was tight and going to McDonald's was like a splurge. And so I think I, and then my dad drastically changed our money space and like what we grew up in. And, um, I think that I had like a mixture, right? Like a mixture of like the scarcity you have to be like really like concerned and conservative with money and, you know, I was budgeting from when I was like eight years old. I can still remember like my tiny little pink plastic box with envelopes and, um, you know, so I, 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 there's this gift in the fact that I had my family history, like changed so much with money, but also, you know, there were 
old money stories that I identified and had to work through and still continue to work through. So that's like a little bit there. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing all of that. And I think it's really amazing that your dad was like, you know, empowered you, especially as a little girl to say, you know, you can do anything. And I think it's so interesting to really look at like what we were told when we were little about money and how we, you know, how we grew up with money. And, you know, if we had money, if we didn't have money, you know, the generational thing, I think is really important. And I can really relate to what you're talking about with like my grandparents didn't have as much money. And then, you know, my parents were like, Hey, you know, we want to prioritize something different and worked really hard to, to give my brother and I more opportunity when it came to money. And it's still so interesting because I've had my own money stories that I've had to work through in my own life and entrepreneurship and business, et cetera, et cetera, which we can certainly dive into a little bit later. But I'm curious, like for you, especially when you're working with clients, like why do you think money and having a good relationship with money is important? And I feel like if you have a good relationship with money, it seems so obvious. Yet I think there's so many people who are like, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to look at this. It makes me really uncomfortable. And I think we we have to face it. We have to face our finances in order to be able to like really allow money and wealth and abundance to flow in. Yeah. Well, I think it's so powerful and important because... If you think about money, I say money is the source that fuels our values. So many, and I grew up very religious. And so for me, that's another piece of my money story that, you know, money is evil to be poor is to, that's like the aspiration is to just like live a simple life, be, you know, like I was exploring like mission work and, you know, you don't, you work really hard and you don't even barely make ends meet and that's something that is praised. And so what I found is actually that as heart centered women who are doing beautiful work in the world, if we get more money into our hands, then we have more, I mean, money is what runs the world. And so then we have more power to do things in our own homes, in, in our communities And to, and, and like I said, heart centered women, we have certain values and money just allows us to then put like more power into those values. So I really teach like value-based spending. And like, for me, one of my values is like having, having a really open home that's very hospitable. And so I invest money into that space in order to allow people to we, I have people work out of my home with me, like co-working stuff. My sister has a little salon set up here and my friends feel like they can come and just make a coffee. Right. But like, it takes money to do that. If you were to really look into your goals and into the impact you want to make in the world, I promise you that there's some level of monetary need there. And so I think the deeper you can access like what is my goal what is my impact that I want to make in the world and you be able to repair or um, empower your money story your money management your money mindset you're going to be able to make more impact and to have a more fulfilled life yeah I'm definitely in alignment with that with what you just said in terms of like you know looking at what you want to do, what your goals are, and then understanding that that money can really help you reach those goals and help you have an impactful life and an empowered life and impact other people as well. And so if somebody is feeling like, you know, hey, I I understand this conceptually, but it's actually like a hard practice. Like where do you start? Like if you're kind of new to the idea of money mindset or money management, like where is a good place to start with all of this? I think that you start simple and I think that's where like, you know, good habit transformation happens and, and and you have to figure out like where, what is, what triggers you and, you know, so it's difficult to say, okay, like for everyone this, but I think it's figuring out where your money story came from, like kind of what we're talking about you, like being able to 
look through that and see what has your money story been and how, what are the gifts of that? And what are the challenges of that? And, um, starting to decide like, Hey, I want to actually not leave this at a subconscious level. And just, I'm continuing to live into the stories that I don't want to, but like bringing it into your conscious awareness And being able to then rewire and change some of the ways your relationship is with money. And then as far as like it goes with management, you know, some of the the consistent challenges I see with female entrepreneurs is this label. I mean, this is a label that people put on themselves that like, I'm just not good with math. I'm not good with numbers. I, I don't, I don't know how to make this stuff work. And I always say nobody is born understanding how to work a, a, an Excel spreadsheet. Nobody's born knowing math. And this is a skill that you can attain. And as a business owner, it's so critical that you figure out tools and coaches and systems that will support you to know the numbers and to begin to make sense of them and be the CFO of your company, because that's when you're able to um, allow your business to impact your personal life, your personal wealth, and uh, create a sustainable, long-term, profitable company. And so if you are out of space right now where you're like, I have no idea what my numbers are. Like I could make people's eyes cross and I don't want to do that. I think, you know, the first step is to maybe figure out like, okay, I just avoid the bank account. I never look at my money. I never. Okay. So maybe a first step for you is to just be willing to like sign into your bank account every day and look at, just look at it. Maybe that's the first step is just looking at the numbers. Um, you know, so I think it's dependent on where you are in your journey, but I think understanding your money story, I have a whole like journaling around drawing out your money story, uh, from childhood through to adulthood and figuring out the gifts and challenges there. And then how do I want to like live and think moving forward? So I, I would challenge people to, to dive into their money story there and then figure out, what are, uh, you know, what am I avoidant of in numbers and how can I begin? And one really tangible thing that I love to do with people and that your listeners could do like in the next 30 minutes is kind of what we we're saying, like identify your next goal. What do you, what is your next monetary goal? And I always say piles of green cash are not very inspiring. Just like, Oh, I'm going to make six figures. or I want to do this. Like, let's actually put meaning and value behind that. So I would love for your audience to think about what is my next monetary goal? Is it to pay off a loan? Is it to, you know, put, have a, a, a savings cushion? Is it, to start to invest in maxing out my Roth IRA, whatever it is, um, figure out what the goal is and figure out the exact number. What is the exact amount of money? I, I many times I'll talk to people, they're like, I have that. And like, how much? Like, oh, I don't know, like 30,000. I'm like, no, we need to get in touch with exactly what the number is. And so figure out what that goal is, figure out your why behind the goal and the exact number. And, and then from there, you can bring your bringing into focus why you want to dig into money and that will help you and motivate you to then do the work of knowing the numbers and figuring out the plan dollar to dollar to get there. Hey friends, we're just taking a quick little break from the episode to talk about Offering Tree. Offering Tree is an all-in-one software for your business, one website and one place for everything. You can host your membership, on-demand library, class schedule, emails, blog posts, and take easy payments all in one spot. As a public benefit company, Offering Tree is helping you first, and they've tried their best to keep their costs as low as possible. They've bundled a ton of value into their essentials plan with no hidden costs or fees. On top of that, Offering Tree is super, super easy to use, which is one of the main reasons that I love working with them and love recommending them for you, yoga teachers. The step-by-step process for setting up your site makes it easy to design something unique in just 30 minutes. Offering Tree's unlimited page builder gives you endless possibilities for business growth. Updating your site is simple and straightforward. Got a workshop or course that you only run once a year? Design a page for it and simply unpublish the page until you need it again. 
And when you reach out to support, you'll be able to talk to a real person. Their world-class support team is here to help. And on top of that, they're offering you a discount for listening to MBO. So if you are interested in checking out Offering Tree, doing a free free trial or learning more, head on over to offeringtree.com forward slash MBO. All right, now back to the episode. Yeah, thanks for going through all of that because I think that that is so helpful. And I really connect with the idea of, yeah, piles of green cash, not that inspiring. And I think even for a lot of us, we kind of, especially I think in the yoga and wellness space, often we think like, Hey, we don't need to like live above our means or we don't need, you know, piles of money just, you know, on our bed. Like we're not the type of people who are looking to like go roll in cash type thing. And if somebody's listening and they are, that's totally cool too. But I think in general, you know, that's the type of people who are attracted to teaching yoga. They're not in it because they want to make, you know, a million dollars a year. Yet at the same time, it's like, we need money in order to survive. We need to be able to pay our rent. We need to be able to afford food. And I think for most of us, we don't want the stress of like living paycheck to paycheck. Like it's nice to have a savings account that feels like you're contributing to regularly. It's nice to be able to treat yourself to a retreat or a trip when you want to. It's nice to be able to think like, hey, I could support my parents as they get older if if that was something I wanted to do. And I think that having that like clear vision of what do I want to do with my money is 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 a pretty amazing way to kind of shift that perspective of like money is greed or money is evil or making money is bad to hey look at what money can actually like empower me to do in my life and my business. So huge. Yeah. I think it's we have those initial thoughts because of what we've been trained by society, by our families. And then when we really bring into focus, why do you want money? Like, wh- how is money not evil in your life? Like, oh, well, let's think about the good money's done for society, for me. Think about what I could do if I was given more money. And think about what would happen if I was able to really achieve some of these monetary goals. Because, you know, law of attraction and all of that, like, if we are saying subconsciously, money is evil, and I don't need it, and I don't want it, I can live a simple life. And yet over here, you're like stressing out because you're barely making rent, or you don't have a retirement plan, you're putting out into the universe these that you are resistant of money, and yet you have a, a need for it. And so being able to be in touch with money and the impact and the goal and like the motivation and feeling like alignment there helps us shift out of this money is icky. I don't, I don't want to pursue that because you know, that then, then we're giving, you know, mixed messages to the universe. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think it's kind of interesting. I did some, some money work a couple of years ago and kind of got into a little bit of like, feng shui with it in terms of like energetics and stuff. And I was like, you know, I'll just try stuff. And I actually really felt like, you know, things like me just becoming aware of my money story and, you know, being like, okay, you know, I'm going to change the dynamic of like where my desk is, because that's going to be like, you know, I'm in more of like a power move now. I feel like these little things just kind of shifted my day-to-day energy and my day-to-day confidence. And as I became more clear on goals and intentions and why I wanted money and the reasons why I thought money was icky and kind of just like worked through that, I felt like it was breaking down these sort of invisible barriers that I created for myself. And all of a sudden it's like, people are hopping in my inbox and are like, Hey, I want to work with you. Hey, I want to buy a course. Hey, I want to sponsor your podcast. And I was like, Whoa, that's cool. (laughs) You know, is, ooh, tell me more about this function. What what's another like one or two cool things that you learned about like with the feng shui and money? I'm curious. Yeah, for sure. So one thing that, and it was actually a guest I had on the show. Um, she had said, close your toilet when you're not using it. So it's like this idea of everything in your space is like energy can come and go. And so you know, your toilet is this space where we like put waste into, and then we flush it. And often we like leave our toilet seats open all day. And she was like, close the toilet seat. So like, you're kind of stopping like the energetics there. And then there's also like the desk. So if you're in 
a room, like say you have an office or an office space, we often want to put our desk maybe towards a window or towards a corner because that feels good for us. But it's actually like, if you can turn your desk towards the door, that's sort of like a power move that kind of says like, Hey, I'm like a boss, babe. Like I'm here. I'm serious. And if you think about, I don't know, if you've worked in corporate or how many people listening have worked in corporate, but I know I've, I have years of corporate experience and people who are like VIPs or like C-suite, like they're always, their desk is always set up. So like you walk in and you see them right away. Just like the power stance, right? Like, or like doing mirror work or stand, you know, it's like getting your energy into this like confidence and you can even do it with how you put your desk in the room. I love it. A hundred percent. Yeah. My husband was pretty like, weirded out by the whole toilet thing for a while, but I was like, you just humor me. Let's try it. And I mean, it's a nice practice in general. Cause when you start thinking about just like the toilet and leaving it open, you're like, Oh, I should just close that. That's like a nice habit. Yeah, it's kind of gross anyways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I don't know. I did all this stuff and really like worked on this. And yeah, like I said, broke down these invisible barriers and I feel like it, it worked for me. I love that. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so I'm curious. So we've talked a little bit about like why money is important, how to start looking at like, you know, shifting our story around money, getting clear on like what we want to use money for. And then one thing I wanted to touch on a little bit more, you said something even like starting to look at your money like every day. So if somebody's the type of person where maybe they haven't set up like a separate business, all their money is just kind of coming into their bank account. They don't really look at it other than when they go to pay their credit cards or their rent. You know, first step, just getting clear on like what's coming in, what's coming out, or or what would you recommend for somebody like that? Yeah. So if we are at that place, I think the first thing that we need to do is you have to open a separate bank account. So we need to operate. And I actually teach a five to six bank account system between your business and your personal. I'm happy to share that if you'd like. But I think the first thing is you have to have separate um, because otherwise everyone has to do, we all have to file taxes as business owners and your P&L sheets are going to be a disaster if you are all intermingled. So if one practical thing you can walk away with is go and open a separate bank account for your business and make sure that then everything that's linked, all your auto pays, everything like that is linked to your new business account and that you have that uh, a card to it. And that's what you're using to operate your business with for sure. And um, in my money matrix system, you know, beyond that, what, what I love to help people do is we need to really understand how much revenue you bring in. Um, each month. And, you know, many times we talk about revenue or that's what we advertise and not like get to six six figure business and all this stuff. But what really matters most is your profitability and your salary. And so what I love to help people do is let's break down, let's see your in months, what your revenue is, what your expenses are. I have people think about their expenses in both what are your fixed expenses that you need to operate your business every month? This is often subscriptions. This could be, um, you know, rent. It could be um, site like things that you pay to contractors. And then also thinking about your variable expenses based upon the month, based upon what you're selling. And then that should give you from there, what is the profit of your company? And then from there, you want to make sure that you are paying yourself a consistent salary. Salary is most important to me because that is what takes the energy of money from your business into your life. And that's where you're able to then support yourself and the causes you believe in and meet your goals, whether it's debt pay down, savings, investing, generosity at some level. Um, And so I really want to focus and I find that even incredibly successful entrepreneurs who have six six or multi six figure brands do not know how to pay themselves consistently. And so we have to look not just backwards at P&L sheets because those are very reactive, but we need to look forward. And so I said, like, you know, you're going to create, figure that out per month, and then you're going to figure that out 
like for the next six to 12 months moving forward. And you want to figure out what that is based on your previous PNL sheets. You can kind of figure out what are general safe numbers. And then I like to press people into and what can you manifest more of in order to pay yourself consistently, increase that salary so that you can then work towards your personal goals. All right, yoga teachers, we're just taking a quick break from the podcast so you can hear from one of my fellow podcast hosts, yoga teachers, and friends. Now, this person might be familiar to you because she's been on the show before. I'm going to let her tell you more about herself and the podcast that she hosts. And once you're finished this episode of the show, definitely make sure you go check out her show. All right, let's get into it. Hello, hello. My name is Lily Ellen Duenas, and I am the host of the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast, your ticket to the global yoga community. Travel around the world and meet yoga teachers from every corner of the globe, from Egypt to Estonia, from Iceland to India, from Ghana to Greece. Learn from the trailblazers in the global yoga community and expand your horizons on what yoga, health, and wellness can mean for you on and off the mat. I'll see you on over at the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure you go check out what Lily's up to. And now let's get back into the episode. Yeah, that's so good. Thanks for all of that. And one thing I'm curious about is, I guess the sell on like the organizational side for somebody who's maybe like, you know, they're making income, but they're kind of starting out and they've got expenses and it's like basically you know, you pay your expenses and you just live off what's less or what's left. Sorry. And this is just basically like how I started. So I'm, I'm curious, like for that type of person, you know, why should they split things up and how do you kind of manage like profits when it's like your profits are essentially everything you need to live? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, part of doing this work is it's helping you to bring, to, to raise their necessity and it's helping you to bring in more money. So when I have people tap into like what we talked about before around your personal wealth goals and you see, okay, I need to make, you know, I can pay off this student loan of $10,000 in the next seven months. If I start paying myself $2,000 more a month, we'll say. I'm just like making up numbers. Well, then if you go into your business and you see, okay, well, right now I'm just making, you know, barely, like I'm just, I have to take everything out of the business and live off of it. Well, what if you started to like see those numbers in the next six months, you know what you have to do to just kind of do what you're saying. You're not just being reactive and living off of, okay, this is what's coming. I'm going to live off of it. But you're starting to be like, okay, I need $2,000 more a month. And I'm really, I have the motivation around it because I know exactly what those $2,000 is going to go towards. You're going to start to do things differently in your business. You're going to start to think about, okay, maybe I'm going to, um, you know, take on a few more clients. Maybe I'm going to offer a retreat. Maybe I'm going to create, you know, and maybe I'm going to go back to my old clientele and offer them the next level. And you're going to start strategizing how you can bring in that money in order to pay off the debt. And so I think it's about understanding where you are right now, not being reactive, but creating a proactive plan with a goal that you're very bought into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love that. And I I love just where you started with that, like part of getting clear on the numbers, part of setting that goal, part of understanding this whole picture and being able to make more money is knowing where we're at. And I think that was definitely like an experience I had was, you know, just starting out of like, okay, I'm taking client work, I'm freelancing, I don't really know what I'm doing. It's like, didn't open a separate bank account was just basically organizing things once a year for taxes, which I a hundred percent do not recommend because it's way more of a hassle than so bad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And yeah, then it's like, you know, finally getting clear on like, you know, sitting down and looking at the numbers and being like, okay, well, you know, this is how much I'm making. This is how much I'm spending. This is how much I need to live. So this is how much more I need to make. And exactly what you were saying. It's like, okay, so I probably need you know, another client and maybe another like stream of revenue. Maybe I can increase prices here. And then it's like, okay, things are flowing a little bit better now. And I think sometimes we just think like, Hey, I'll just kind of ignore this or, Hey, I don't want to look at this or I'm not interested or I'm not good at math. Like you said, and we just kind of push it to the side because life's busy. That's what we do. 
yet it's if you want to make more money and just feel empowered in your business, I feel like this is such a great first step to to getting clarity around that. Yay. This is awesome. (laughs) And so I'm curious if somebody's listening who's like kind of gone through all those first initial steps and they're like, yeah, I kind of understand, you know, everything's set up. Yeah, you know, I'm I still want to like continue to make more money in my business and make more money without adding hours to the plate. Like we don't want to be, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week. What are some of your tips for that? Yeah. Well, I think that this also comes down to our money mindset because often our pricing strategy is off. And so I think you know, making sure that your pricing is aligned. Many times I find that women that I'm working with, so most of the we start working together through my Wealthy Woman Intensive and then they're like, okay, so I realize I need to revamp on my offers and my pricing strategy. We find that many times women are undercharging for their work. And when you actually dig into like the profitability of you know, oh man, I have this client and I'm, you know, charging them $200 a session. But then you think about, well, after taxes and after the fact that I have to pay for all this software and and this team, I'm actually only making, you know, $60. So I think, you know, when you start to to understand the numbers, it, it also gives you this motivation. You start to do market research and you see, okay, this is where I sit in the marketplace. And so I think understanding and being very confident around your pricing strategy and it's confidence, right? It's mindset work. It's money work around feeling okay and worthy to ask for more. Um, and then, you know, my strategy is, and this also is very dependent on people and what are their assets and what are their gifts and what do they love? But, you know, many times that I teach for sure, like a, a, a more towards the higher ticket model. So if we reverse engineer, if you need to make $2,000 more, uh, if we go with our same example, a month, it's going to take a lot of money, a lot of membership. You know, if you're doing a membership model, a lot of members to sign up to get you to that extra amount of money. But it could also just be like a higher transformative program that's higher touch that you can charge a lot more for. And so I think people have to identify what is the market demanding, where where is the opportunity in the market, and what makes me feel alive and aligned, and I have the expertise and gifts to bring, and just making sure that you're, you know, asking your worth in that and developing a strategy that's going to get you uh, more money. Cool. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think that it's super helpful to hear that and. I think it's just coming back to like, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that's just going to automatically happen. Like this is something we need to, you know, put work into. And for me, it's also been like stages of work, like kind of, you know, we talked about the beginning stages. I shared a little bit about that. And then for me, it was kind of like, okay, money's coming in. Now I have to go through what you're talking about with like, Hey, I want to make more money, but I don't want to be working more than full time hours. So I need to look at like, what are my prices like? Because clearly something's like misaligned. And that was a whole other money journey for me where it was like, am I worthy of asking for money for more money? There's fear attached, right? Like there's fear that people are going to say no to your prices, that people are going to say no to increasing the amount. And then, you know, for me, my head was spinning a little bit like, what if I ask for more money? They say no. And then my two choices are like, okay, I'll keep working for this price or knowing that my worth is more and then needing to move on from that client and actually seeing my like income go down. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's like you, that's when you have to dig so deep in the, the possibility and the abundance of money and the belief that you can, you can create it and you have access to it and that it's okay to hear no's. It's okay for it to dip down because you know that it's available to you and that you're like just calling it out and figuring out where where it's going to come for for you in, in an aligned way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know we talked about, we just talked about pricing strategy and a little bit about offers, but once you know your numbers as well, you can start to see where you have room to you, invest in stuff inside of your business that's going to be giving you great ROI. You know, for me, my journey has been 
figuring out exactly what my company needs me to do and then figuring out, well, I have this space. If I were to hire an assistant to do all this work, then and they just brought me based on that work, like my marketing team, like a few extra clients a month. I mean, that more than pays for it. I can stay in my zone of genius. I can work a lot less. I can have somebody who's way more um, savvy with, with marketing and the different things do that work. And so you know, as you get to know your numbers and, and you desire to like not have to work 70 hours, well, you can start to understand what you can outsource and how you can really truly work less, make more, doing more of what you love. And I also really challenge people to do this in their personal life as well. So as business owners, I think that we're hesitant to outsource. And once we know the numbers and we're still like, oh my gosh, but what if I still, what if I don't make it? I know I can afford this content writer now, but will I be able to afford her in three months? And obviously that's knowing the data, but also the mindset piece. But once we press into outsourcing and business, it feels like another full hurdle to do it in our personal life. And that's something huge that I challenged myself with this past year. And I've pressed into and asking for help and getting help in, inside of my home because I was recognizing, okay, I've got two companies I'm scaling. I'm a mom of two now. And for me, it's more valuable for me to spend my time doing the zone of genius things in each company and then being able to be a very like present wife and mom and friend and that means that I'm going to outsource my laundry and my meal planning and cleaning my home and you know that I can I can do that because it's I, I know the numbers and I can pay the hourly rate there and make it up you know in in my business work because it I'm in my zone. And so I challenge people to think about, you know, time and our time is incredibly valuable and money can buy us time and allow us to then be present in the ways that we want to and and bring the impact we want to in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love all of that. And I actually had a really similar experience to what you're talking about with outsourcing and then actually having a good chunk of my income taken away. Uh, I decided that I wanted to bring on somebody to help me with podcast editing and then also hire a virtual assistant in the winter of 2019. So kind of just pre-pandemic, I think it was like December, 2019 and, or, or maybe November, 2019. And so I found somebody to come on five hours a week to help me with VA stuff and then outsource my podcast production. And it was amazing because I got to make this list of things that like I wasn't super inspired about and kind of pass these things off. And then I was able to look at like, okay, what do I want to focus on now? And then the end of December, a pretty like big part of my income that was doing some, some coaching for another company was like, oh, we like don't have, like we've shifted and we just are not having like freelancers or contractors basically anymore. And so there's no like job for you. And I was like, oh my God, like I just brought two people on my team that, you know, I'm paying for now. And I had a little bit of a panic attack, like how on earth am I going to make this work? And came back to, you know, the goal of this was to free myself up so that I could bring new things on. And this is just another opportunity. You know, one door closes, another one opens, another opportunity to bring more stuff that I'm aligned with on. And it ended up working out fine, but I can a hundred percent relate to that, that fear, especially when you have other people that are relying on you and you need to pay them, you know, like you have to pay them for their work. And I so I appreciate, you, deep. you know, you believed that you could find ways to make it in other places that were really aligned for you. And, you know, that I think that's exactly what we have to do is we have to combat that fear with like, I am a magical being that can go produce more and call in more money. And I'm going to just believe in myself around that. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I love that. You put that very beautifully. And um, the other thing I wanted to touch on that you mentioned was um, with the like, the outsourcing in terms of other things. Cause I think sometimes we think like, Hey, in my business, these are the things that are not my zone of genius. These are the things that don't, you know, bring me joy that somebody else might really love like social media or copywriting or something like that. But also just the idea of like, you know, what is taking my time outside of my work? Like what is taking me away from my business and things like yeah, cooking, cleaning, laundry, 
is huge. And, you know, we've hired somebody to come in once a week and, and clean our house, which is such a gift and such a blessing and, you know, fully acknowledge the privilege that comes with that. But that's something I don't have to spend my time on now, which means like in, you know, the afternoon while my baby's sleeping, which is like precious time for, for me to do some work. If I don't have child support, it's like, I don't have to worry about, you know, cleaning my toilet or, you know, washing the dishes or something like that. It's like, I can come and focus on my business, which then brings more wealth and abundance. And which is, it's pretty cool to see like that cycle work once you start kind of leaning into it and believing that it's possible. Yeah. And you have, to, you have, I think what I've found in myself is like a whole nother set of thoughts and challenges I have to work through because then it's like, oh, all of a sudden, like I, and I, I, I love how you said, like, you're so grateful for the privilege and it is a privilege. And, but you know, many, it, you, you face judgment, right. When that, cause it's, it's okay. It's more socially acceptable to outsource admin work and social media, you know, business stuff. But when, when you're outsourcing like laundry and all, all of a sudden that becomes like, wow, bougie Aaron, you know? And then I have to like really work through that and be like, you know, this is, this is what I need to do to make the impact and just really feel like I can be present in the ways I want to be. So it's like a whole nother set of some, for some strange reason. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with society and women and women's roles and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But sometimes when we start to be like, well, I do 10 hours of work in laundry and I do 10 hours of work in my emails. Why isn't it okay to outsource both? (laughs) But there's just societal things that I think we have to push up against with that. Mm A hundred percent. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is so true. You see people, you know, talking about having, having help in their homes, like getting shamed for it. It's like, yeah, people don't, don't often get shamed for having virtual assistants and stuff like that. And so I think it's, you know, acknowledging, you know, the work that you've done and the, the blessings that you have. And then also just kind of ignoring the noise that says like, Hey, you're like bougie to have this person. It's like, you know, this helps me, this helps me be a better mother. This helps me be a better CEO, a better business owner, better yoga teacher, better partner, all those things. So, you know, it's worth it for me to invest in that. Yes. I'm excited for your audience and like what this is going to inspire them to outsource. Yeah. A hundred percent. Me too. Yeah. Maybe some, if any listeners are inspired to outsource, definitely let us know. Um, It'd be cool to hear that. And I'm curious, one thing I always like to ask on the, on the show is just business lessons you've learned in your own business. And obviously you've done a lot, you've grown a hugely successful business for yourself, you know, over the years, what are some of the big business lessons that you've learned, Erin? I would love to share like this one that happened about a year ago. And it's something that I'm just like continuing to remind myself of and turn the volume up on, you know, about, it was just over a year ago that I found myself in this place where I was feeling very misaligned and I had sort of abandoned myself, my intuition and decided that, you know, in order to grow in this online space as a business coach and doing this stuff, I have to do what people do. I have to hire the gurus and spend the money and build the funnels and have the timers and have a coaching team underneath me. And so I went all in and created this whole program and hired a curriculum writer and, you know, spent, joined the high end mastermind and all that stuff and found myself like, whoa, like this doesn't feel right. Like, I don't feel like I'm working with the people I want to work with doing the, doing what I want to do with them and selling the way I really want to sell and market myself. And so I decided to not worry about the loss of time and money. Cause sometimes I think we keep doing things because, well, I've invested so much into this. I, I can't possibly shut it down. And I was like, I have to pause and like tap into my intuition. And, um, I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned is never abandon that always be having space and intentionality around turning up. What is your intuition telling you? What feels aligned? And, um, even if it's not what's industry standard or what's, you know, trending now, I think that, we we have we know inside of ourselves what feels right what is right and like what our path is and so 
what, wherever you are in your business journey, I really encourage you to filter your decisions through your own intuition and um, it'll never lead you astray. Mm, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Erin. This has been such a fabulous conversation. I'm so grateful for everything that you've shared today. And hopefully listeners are learning a lot. Um, if people want to learn more about you, work with you, you know, learn about a program that you've got going on, where can they find all that? And can you tell us a bit more about what might be available to them? Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm most active on social on Instagram and I'm very relational. I love getting in the DMs, chatting. Um, so follow me there. My name's, it's uh, my name, but you got to spell it right. So it's E-R-I-N-N underscore Bridgman, B-R-I-D-G-M-A-N. And then, yeah, I, um, you can definitely hop on the wait list. I only open my program a couple times a year. And that is the main container that I work with people in a group setting where we go through my money matrix we dial in understanding all of the numbers in your business and your personal life and we do transformative work around your money mindset and then i have a ton of tools and resources a budget tool understanding your sacred money archetype different things like that so you can head to my website and find all the links there amazing thank you so much for your time today and for everything you've shared this has been this has been so great thank you amanda for having me All right, friends, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with Erin Bridgman. She just had so much good stuff to share. So make sure you go check her out, follow along with everything she's got up to, maybe check out some of her programs and resources. And at the very least, hopefully as we step into the end of this year, hopefully you're looking at your finances and maybe setting some financial and money goals for 2023. I would love to hear them. So feel free to email info at mbomyoga.com or share over over on social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. A big thank you to Offering Tree for sponsoring this episode. You guys, they are so amazing. Make sure you go check them out, offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM to get a little discount. And a big thank you to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I'm just so grateful for this community. As always, I will see you next week. Okay, bye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. To find links, notes, resources, and everything mentioned in today and all episodes of the show, you can head on over to mbomyoga.com. You can find the podcast and myself on Facebook and social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. And I would love for you to join the private Facebook community, Yoga Business Badasses. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please make sure you reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. And last of all, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. It would mean the world. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.